everyone! I'm Miss Mary Beth. I'm the Youth Services Librarian at Ingalls Memorial Library here in Ringe. And I'm here today for Armchair Adventures. That's our series where every day I read a chapter of a book to you and eventually we read a whole book together. And the book we're working on right now is The Wind in the Willows. And this is written by Kenneth Graham. And this is the story of mainly four animal friends going on adventures along the river and in the woods and all outside. And our two main friends, Mole and Water Rat, they like to hang out on the water, right? They go boating a lot. And they have adventures with Mr. Badger, who's a very nice man. <laughs> very nice badger. <laughs> and then Toad. Toad is a little eccentric, isn't he? He has a lot of different hobbies. He goes from one hobby and gets really excited about it, and then he gets a little bored, so he moves on to another hobby. His current hobby is driving motor cars. This book was written in 1908, so cars were just coming out. So he gets really excited about them, but is he a good driver? Do you think so? Mm-mm. He's not a very good driver. And he gets into a lot of accidents. And his latest adventure was his three friends all tried to get him to stop driving motor cars because he crashed seven of them. But he refused. So he escaped and he snuck out because they were trying to get him to get rid of his habit of driving the motor cars. They staged a little intervention, but he escaped their intervention, and he stole a motor car, right? And then he crashed it. And so then he got in trouble with the police. And the last we left off, he was in a dungeon for 20 years. He went to jail. He was a reckless toad. So that was where we left off. So let's see what happens in Chapter 7. The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. The willow wren was twittering his thin little song, hidden himself in the dark selvage of the riverbank. Though it was past ten o'clock at night, the sky still clung to and retained some lingering skirts of light from the departed day, and the sullen heats of the torrid afternoon broke up and rolled away at the dispersing touch of the cool fingers of the short midsummer night. Mole stretched on the bank, still panting from the stress of the fierce day that had been cloudless from dawn to late sunset, and he waited for his friend to return. He had been on the river with some companions, leaving the water rat free to keep an engagement of long standing with Otter. And Mole had come back to find the house dark and deserted, and no sign of Rat, who was doubtless keeping it up late with his old comrade. It was still too dark to think of staying indoors, so he lay on some cool dock leaves and thought over the past day and its doings, and how very good they had been. The rat's light footfall was presently heard approaching over the parched grass. Oh, the blessed coolness, Rat said, and sat down gazing thoughtfully onto the river, silent and preoccupied. "'You stayed to supper, of course,' said the mole presently. "'Simply had to,' said the rat. "'They wouldn't hear of my going before. "'You know how kind they always are. "'And they made things as jolly for me as ever they could, "'right up to the moment I left. "'But I felt a brute all the time, "'and it was clear to me that they were very unhappy, "'but they tried to hide it. "'Mole, I'm afraid they are in trouble. "'Little Portly is missing again, "'and you know what a lot his father thinks of him, "'though he never says much about it. Do you think his father is Otter? I think so. Let's see. What? The child? said the mole lightly. Well, suppose he is. Why worry about it? He's always straying off and getting lost and turning up again. He's so adventurous. But no harm ever happens to him. Everybody hereabouts knows him and likes him, just as they do old Otter. And you may be sure some animal or an other will come across him and bring him back again, all right? Why, we found him ourselves, miles from home, and quite self-possessed and cheerful. Yes, but this time it's more serious, said the rat gravely. He has been missing for some days now, and the otters have hunted everywhere, high and low, without finding the slightest trace. And they've asked every animal, too, for miles around, and no one knows anything about him. Otter's evidently more anxious than he'll admit. I got out of him that young Portly hasn't learned to swim very well yet, and I can see he's thinking of the where. There's a lot of water coming down still, considering the time of year. And the place has always had a fascination for the child. And then there are, well, traps and things. You know. Otter's not the fellow to be nervous about any son of his before it's time. And now he is nervous. When I left, he came out with me, said he wanted some air, and talked about stretching his legs. But I could see it wasn't that. So I drew him out and pumped him, and got it from him all at last. Otter was going to spend the night watching by the ford. You know the place where the old ford used to be, in bygone days before they built the bridge. I know it well, said the mole, but why should Otter choose to watch there? 
Well, it seems that it was there he gave Portly his first swimming lesson, continued the rat, from that shallow, gravelly spit near the bank. And it was there he used to teach him fishing, and there young Portly caught his first fish, of which he was so very proud. The child loved the spot, and Otter thinks that if he came wandering back from wherever he is, if he is anywhere by this time, poor little chap, he might make for the ford he was so fond of, or if he came across it he'd remember it well, and he'd stop there and play, perhaps. So Otter goes there every night and watches, on the chance, you know, just on the chance. They were silent for a time, both thinking of the same thing, the lonely, heart-sore animal crouched by the ford, watching and waiting, the long night through on the chance that his son would come back. Oh, no. Well, well, said the rat presently. I suppose we ought to be thinking about turning in. But he never offered to move. Rat, said the mole. I simply can't go and turn in I, and go to sleep and do nothing, even though there doesn't seem anything to be done. We'll get the boat out and we'll paddle upstream. The moon will be up in an hour or so, and then we will search as well as we can. Anyhow, it will be better than going to bed and doing nothing. Just what I was thinking myself, said the rat. It's not the sort of night for bed anyhow, and daybreak is not so very far off, and then we may pick up some news of him from early risers as we go along. Hmm, a good idea. They got the boat out, and the rat took the skulls, paddling with caution. Out in midstream there was a clear, narrow track that faintly reflected the sky, but wherever shadows fell on the water from bank, bush, or tree, they were as solid to all appearance as the banks themselves, and the mole had to steer with judgment accordingly. Dark and deserted as it was, the night was full of small noises, song and chatter and rustling, telling of the busy little population who were up and about, plying their trades and vocations through the night till sunshine should fall on them at last, and send them off to their well-earned repose. The water's own noises, too, were much more apparent than by day, its gurglings and cloops more unexpected and near at hand, and constantly they started at what seemed to be a sudden clear call from an actual articulate voice. The line of the horizon was clear and hard against the sky and in one particular quarter it showed black against a silvery climbing phosphorescence that grew and grew. At last, over the rim of the waiting earth, the moon lifted with slow majesty till it swung clear of the horizon and rode off, free of its moorings. And once more they began to see surfaces, meadows widespread and quiet gardens, and the river itself from bank to bank, all softly disclosed, all washed clean of mystery and terror. All radiant again as by day, but with a difference that was tremendous. Their old haunts greeted them again in other raiment, as if they had slipped away and put on this pure new apparel and come quietly back, smiling as they shyly waited to see if they would be recognized again under it. Fastening their boat to a willow, the friends landed in this silent silver kingdom and patiently explored the hedges, the hollow trees, the tunnels, and their little culverts, the ditches and dry waterways. Embarking again and crossing over, they worked their way up the stream in this manner, while the moon, serene and detached in a cloudless sky, did what she could though so far off, to help them in their quest, till her hour came and she sank earthwards, earthwards reluctantly, and left them, and mystery once more held field and river. Then a change began slowly to declare itself. The horizon became clearer, field and tree came more into sight, and somehow with a different look. The mystery began to drop away from them. A bird piped suddenly and was still, and a light breeze sprang up and set the reeds and bulrushes rustling. Rat, who was in the stern of the boat, while Mole scold, sat up suddenly and listened with a passionate intenseness. Mole, who with gentle strokes was just keeping the boat moving while he scanned the banks with care, looked at him with curiosity. It's gone, sighed the rat, sinking back in his seat again, so beautiful and strange and new. Since it was so, well, since it was to end so soon, I almost wish I had never heard it, for it has roused a longing in me that is pain and nothing seems worthwhile. But just to hear that sound once more, and go on listening to it forever. No! <gasps> there it is again! He cried, alert once more. Entranced, he was silent for a long space, spellbound. Now it passes on, and I begin to lose it, he said presently. Oh, Mole, the beauty of it! The merry bubble and joy! The thin, clear, happy call of the distant piping! Such music I never dreamed of. And the call in it is stronger even than the music is sweet. Row on, Mole! Row! For the music and call must be for us. The mole, greatly wondering, obeyed. I hear nothing myself, he said, but the wind playing in the reeds and rushes and osiers. The rat never answered, and if indeed he heard. Wrapped, transpo transported, trembling, he was possessed in all his senses by this new divine thing that caught up his helpless soul and swung and dandled it, a powerless but happy infant, in a strong, sustaining gasp 
grasp. In silence, Mole rode steadily, and soon they came to the point where the river divided, a long backwater branching off to one side. With a slight movement of his head, Rat, who had long dropped the rudder lines, directed the warrior to take the back water. The creeping tide of light gained and gained, and now they could see the color of the flowers that gemmed the water's edge. Clearer and nearer still, cried the Rat joyously. Now you must surely hear it. Ah, uh, at last, I see you do. Breathless and transfixed, the mole stopped rowing as the liquid run of that glad piping broke on him like a wave, caught him up, and possessed him utterly. He saw the tears on his comrade's cheeks and bowed his head and understood. For a space they hung there, brushed by the purple loose strife that fringed the bank. Then the clear, imperious summons that marched hand in hand with the intoxicating melody imposed its will on Mole, and mechanically he beat his oars again. And the light grew steadily as stronger, but no bird sang as they were wont to do at the approach of dawn. But for the heavenly music, all was marvelously still. On either side of them, as they glided onwards, the rich meadow grass seemed that morning of a freshness and a greenness unsurpassable. Never had they noticed the roses so vivid, the willow herbs so righteous, the meadow sweet so odorous and pervading. Then the murmur of the approaching weir began to hold the air, and they felt a consciousness that they were nearing the end, whatever it might be, that surely awaited their expedition. A wide half-circle of foam and glinting lights and shining soldiers of green water the great weir closed the backwater from bank to bank, troubled all the quiet surface with twirling eddies and floating foam streaks, and deadened all other sounds with its solemn and soothing rumble. In midmost of the stream, embraced in the weir's shimmering arm spread, a small island lay anchored, fringed close with willow and silver birch and alder. Reserved, shy, but full of significance, it hid whatever might hold behind a veil, keeping it till the hour should come, and with it hour, those who were called and chosen. Slowly, but with no doubt or hesitation whatever, and in something of a solemn expectancy, the two animals passed through the broken, tumultuous water and moored their boat at the flowery margin of the island. In silence they landed, and pushed through the blossom and scented herbage and undergrowth that led up to the level ground, till they stood on a little lawn of marvelous green, set round with nature's own orchard trees, crab apple, wild cherry, and sloe. This is the place of my song dream. The place the music played to me, whispered the rat, as if in a trance. Here, in this holy place, here, if anywhere, surely we shall find him. Then suddenly the mole felt a great awe fall upon him, an awe that turned his muscles to water, bowed his head, rooted his feet to the ground. It was no panic terror. Indeed, he felt wonderfully at peace and happy. But it was an awe that the smote and held him, and without seeing, he knew it could only mean some august presence was very, very near. With difficulty, he turned to look for his friend, and saw him at his side, cowed, stricken, and trembling violently. And still there was utter silence, and the populous bird haunted branches around them, and still the light grew and grew. Perhaps he would never have dared to raise his eyes, but that, though the piping was now hushed, the call and the summons seemed still dominant and imperious. He might not refuse were death himself, waiting to strike him instantly, once he had looked with mortal eye on things rightly kept hidden. Trembling, he obeyed and raised his humble head, and then, in that other clearness of the imminent dawn, while nature flushed with fullness of, of incredible color, seemed to hold her breath for the event, and he looked in the very eyes of the friend and helper, saw the backward sweep of curved horns gleaming in the glowing daylight, saw the stern hooked nose between the kindly eyes that were looking down on them humorously, while the bearded mouth broke into a half-smile at the corners. He saw the rippling muscles on the arm that lay across the broad chest, the long, supple hands still holding the pan pipes only just fallen away from parted lips, and he saw the splendid curves of the shaggy limbs disposed in majestic ease on the sword, at la and saw, last of all, nestling between his very hooves, sleeping soundly in entire peace and contentment, the little, round, podgy, childish form of the baby otter. Ah! Oh, they found him. All this he saw for one moment, breathless and intense, vivid on the morning sky, and still, as he looked, he lived, and still, as he lived, he wondered. Rat, Mole found breath to, breath to whisper, shaking. Are you afraid? Afraid, murmured the rat, his eyes shining with unutterable love. Afraid of him? Oh, never, never, and yet, and yet, oh, Mole, I am afraid. Then the two animals, crouching to the earth, bowed their heads and worshipped. Sudden and magnificent, the sun's broad golden disk showed itself over the horizon facing them, 
and the first rays shooting across the level water meadows took the animals full in the eyes and dazzled them. When they were able to look once more, the vision had vanished, and the air was full of the carol of birds that held the dawn. Do you think they saw what they actually saw? Hmm. As they stared blankly, in dumb misery deepening as they slowly realized that all they had seen and all they had lost, a capricious little breeze, dancing up from the surface of the water, tossed the aspen, shook the dewy roses, and blew lightly and caressingly on their faces, and with its soft touch came instant oblivion. For this is the last best gift that the kindly demigod is careful to bestow on those whom he has revealed himself in their helping, the gift of forgetfulness. Hmm, did they see the demigod Pan? Did they see him? Lest the awful remembrance should remain and grow and overshadow mirth and pleasure, and the great haunting memory should spoil all the afterlives of little animals helped out of difficulties, in order that they should be happy and light-hearted as before. So do you think the demigod, which is a half-god, helped find help them find the otter? Do you think he helped the little baby otter? I don't know. They won't remember him, though. And that's okay. Mole rubbed his eyes and stared at Rat, who was looking at him in a puzzled sort of way. I beg your pardon. What did you say, Rat? He asked. I think I was only remarking, said Rat slowly, that this was the right sort of place, and that here, if anywhere, we should find him. And look! <gasps> Why, there he is, the little fellow! And with a cry of delight, he ran towards the slumbering portly. But Mole stood a minute, held in thought, as one wakened slowly from a beautiful dream, who struggles to recall it, and can capture nothing but a dim sense of the beauty of it. The beauty! Till that, too, fades away in its turn, and the dreamer bitterly accepts the hard, cold waking and all its penalties. So Mole, after struggling with his memory for a brief space, shook his head sadly and followed the rat. Portly woke up with a joyous squeak, and wiggled with pleasure at the sight of his father's friends, who had played with him so often in past days. In a moment, however, his face grew blank, and he fell to hunting around in a circle with pleading whine, as a child that has fallen happily asleep in its nurse's arms, and wakes to find itself alone and laid in a strange place, and searches corners and cupboards and runs from room to room, despair growing silently in its heart. Even so, Portly scratched, searched the island and searched, dogged and unwearying, until at last the black moment came for giving up, and he sat down and cried bitterly. But the mole ran quickly to comfort the little animal, but Rat, lingering, looked long and doubtfully at certain hoof marks deep in the ground. Some great animal has been here, he murmured slowly and thoughtfully, and he stood musing, musing, his mind strangely stirred. Come along, Rat, called the mole. Think of poor Otter waiting up there by the ford. Portly had soon been com comforted by the promise of a treat, a jaunt on the river in Mr. Rat's real boat, and the two animals conducted him to the water side, placed him securely between them in the bottom of the boat, and paddled off down the backwater. The sun was fully up by now, and hot on them, and birds sang lustily and without restraint, and flowers smiled and nodded from either bank. But somehow, so thought the animals, with less of riches and blaze of color than they remember, seemed to remember seeing quite recently somewhere. They wondered where. The rain river reached again. They turned the boat's head upstream, towards the point where they knew their friend was keeping his lonely vigil. As they drew near the familiar ford, the mole took the boat into the bank, and they lifted Portly out and set him on his legs in the tow path, gave him his smarting orders and a friendly farewell and a pat on the back, and shoved out to midstream. The two friends watched the little animal as he waddled along the path contentedly and with importance, watched him till they saw his muzzle suddenly lift, and his waddle break into a clumsy amble as he quickened his pace with shrill whines and wriggles of recognition. Looking up the river, they could see Otter start up, tense and rigid, from out of the shadows, where he crouched in dumb patience and could hear his amazed and joyous bark as he bounded up through the oysters on the path. Then the mole, with a strong pull on one oar, swung the boat round and let the full stream bear down on them again. Whither it would, their quest now happily ended. I feel strangely tired, Rat, said the mole, leaning wearily on his oars as the boat drifted. It's being up all night, you'll say, perhaps, but that's nothing. We do as much half the nights of the week, that this time of year. No, I feel as if I've been through something very exciting and rather terrible, and it was just over, and yet nothing particular has happened. Or something very surprising and splendid and beautiful, murmured the rat, leaning back and closing his eyes. I feel just as you do, Mole. Simply dead tired, though not body tired. It's lucky we've got this dream with us to take us home. Isn't it jolly to feel the sun again soaking into one's bones and hark to the wind playing in the reeds? It's like music, far away music, said the Mole, nodding drowsily. So I was thinking, murmured the rat, dreamful and languid. Dance music, the lilting sort that runs on without a stop, but words in it too. 
passes on words and out of them again. I catch them at intervals. Then it is dance music once more, and then nothing but the reed's soft, thin whispering. You hear better than I, said the mole sadly. I cannot catch the words. Let me try and give you them, said the rat softly, his eyes still closed. Now it is turning into words again, faint but clear. Lest the Asha dwell, and turn your frolic to fret, you shall look upon my power at helping hour. But then you shall forget. Now the reeds take it up. Forget, forget, they sigh, and it dies away in a rustle and a whisper. Then the voice returns. Lest limbs be reddened and rent, I spring the trap that is set, as as I loose the snare, you may glimpse me there, for surely you shall forget. Row nearer, mole, nearer to the reeds, it's hard to catch, but the sound I hear grows each minute fainter. Helper and healer I cheer, small waifs in the woodland wet, strays I find in it, wounds I bind in it, bidding them all forget. Nearer, mole! No, no, it is g no good. The song has died away into reed talk. But what do those words mean? asked the wondering mole. That I do not know, said the rat simply. I passed them on to you as they reached me. Ah, now they return again, and this time full and clear. This time at last it is real. The unmistakable thing, simple, passionate, perfect. <gasps> Well, let's have it then, said the mole, after he had waited patiently, half dozing in the hot sun. But no answer came. He looked and understood the silence, with a smile of much happiness on his face, and something of a listening look still lingering there. The weary rat was fast asleep. And that is the end of chapter seven. Huh. Well, here's a picture of our friends. And you see up there, the otters meeting each other again? I'm really glad that they found the baby otter. But do you think that the god of the forest helped them to find their friend? I don't know. I think that's a nice thought. So let's see what happens in chapter 8 tomorrow. I'll see you again at 3 o'clock. Thanks for reading with me. Have a fun day.